All right, welcome back to the My Life Sam Radford podcast. On this episode, we have battle rapper, rapper, battle rap league owner, podcast entrepreneur in the battle rap world, and now a dog rescuer. So he's turned himself into a superhero. Today, we welcome Dirtbag Dan, a.k.a. Daniel Martinez. Thanks for being on, Dan. Hey, what's up, guys? How's everybody doing today? What's up, Sam? Yo. All right, man. So I just kind of started all off with um, your introduction to hip hop, like how you first fell in love with it, you know, like that, that one moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I, uh, oops, kill alarms for dogs. I, uh, I started rapping probably when I was like, I want to say like 14, 15 years old, but I always listened to hip hop music. I think the first tape I ever bought was uh, parents just don't understand when I was like an eight year old or something like that. Um, and we used to just kind of bullshit me and the, my buddy, Brian and the homie Skyler, who used to do the podcast with us. We were just like freestyle about dumb shit. And then um, at some point I was like, Oh, I'm pretty good at this. So I, I kept up doing it by the time I was like 16 or 17, I was like entering rap battles and stuff. And like really battling was my first introduction to music like open mics and then open mics turn to battles i was like certainly doing rap battles and freestyling before i had ever like even thought about writing a song or anything like that all right yeah no that makes sense um i'm a big fan of your music as well as your battles but uh let's i i speak on uh to many battlers on the podcast and i've spoken about the history of it so i just want to talk about um your introduction because you started during the freestyle era right when you were battling yeah, yeah, yeah. so what 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 what's your like biggest uh point of view on the change in battle rap on how like it used to be so pure and so uh innocent and now it just seems to be so wwe you know what i mean uh i guess i think like the initial form of battle rap being like freestyle and like off the top kind of limited us in a lot of ways but uh kept the nature of it more lighthearted because you weren't like doing like super it was hard to at least there were definitely people oh hey penny shut up penny hey hey penny shut up what are you doing that's my dog penny she's a <laughs> that's, sweetheart that's a great um, that's a great uh guest we got another guest on it's good penny why are you being an ass so uh like character assassination and stuff like that was certainly harder to do when you were like coming up with stuff off the top of your head versus like having to being able to write for opponents and shit like to get inside the house you get your little buddy out you get it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um i think battling became more like hardcore and and like wwe ish certainly around 2008 when we started writing rap battles like for like the first grind time events and stuff like that and but before that it was like certainly more lighthearted in the sense that you had to come up with everything off the top of your head. You were just freestyling. So um, a lot of just like jokes about appearance and shit like that. All right. Yeah. Like I, I always say in my personal opinion, the golden era of battle rap would probably be 2011, 2012 when it was still, it, it became the written format and everybody kind of congregated around the world. And you had these leagues pop up all over the world. And then a person like you became uh, international battle rapper so like i want to speak on you you grew up uh rapping in san jose where you're from 408 dirtbag dan the best rapper from the 408 um <laughs> but like wh what was it like the first time you went to another country um england was the first country we went to and it was certainly nuts for me because i had like i had hardly left san jose at that point i think we had done some shows in like la and san diego uh when i was with a group called thunder hut when I was like 18 and 19. Um, and I was already like 25, 26 when the battling shit kicked off. Like I went to college, I stopped freestyle rapping and we started counterproductive and we were just like making music and doing shows in the area. And I was going to art school. And uh, right when I finished school, 2008 is when like the first battle rap events happened. And um, within a year, I realized I was like, oh, they're doing this shit overseas. Uh, I could I could definitely get the fuck out of here using this. So right off the bat, I like try to make the connection with the don't flop guys, and then set up an event. It was supposed to be meet the Saurus and <laughs> it was supposed to be meet the Saurus and um, 
madness that went initially and that the source actually got stopped at the airport because he said he was a rapper, which was a very valuable lesson we learned right off the bat. Um, and then it was just nuts walking around in London, like full culture shock. I was there for like two weeks. I hated the food. I hated the weather, <laughs> but the people were super cool. And uh, I had a good time. And my buddy Stig of the Dump, uh, who was like an old school freestyle battler, guy who makes great music he put us up that when we were out there so i was lucky enough to have like an english person take me around england and give me the whole experience you know yeah that's hilarious you say that i i visited my granddad for the first time in 2012 in england and um i remember it was the first time i ate a salad with no salad dressing and he just didn't understand he's like i was trying to put garlic in his mashed potatoes he's like sam sam we don't do that but yeah it was definitely a culture shock and like some depressing ass parts if you're there during like the rainy days and stuff you go down to oh like, yeah, yeah black yeah, pool was like super depressing like yeah and, but and beautiful like, uh, transportation too like getting from one part of the city to another part of the city is like just insane you have to like take four hours and 10 trains you know so <laughs> i was uh i had fun but i was really happy to get back and then I kind of made it my mission to get around the world as much as possible. So we went to Australia right away, Sweden, Philippines, um, back to Sweden, back to Australia. Like I was back to England, um, Hawaii. We, I just tried to like kind of put as many pins on the map as possible. And I think I was in the lead for a while. And then disaster passed me up around like 2014 or 15. Uh, but I was definitely the most traveled at, at some point, you know? Oh yeah, man. I, uh, he didn't mention this one. This will show how much of a fan I am. He once did a battle on mushrooms in Amsterdam or maybe Amsterdam. Yeah. Was it mushrooms? It was, it was something that yeah, was uh, magic truffles, which is magic like truffles. the legal version of, uh, psilocybin in, um, Amsterdam or in Denmark, but they're tough. It was definitely an experience. I like that's just, that shows you how much traveling I did too. I, I didn't even think about Denmark was another country that we went to. Um, shouts out to Malmo, Sweden. Every time we were in Malmo, we also we would take a train to Christiania, and that was super fun. Look at these idiots! What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if so, there's three dogs uh, running around, if people are yeah. just listening, there's multiple. Seven. Um, like seven I want to actually get your perspective on something because I find um, nostalgia. People always find this funny. I spoke to Kruger about um, Pedro from Don't Flop and how much I love him as a character. And I remember yeah. you once on one of your podcasts speaking about being in Amsterdam and you were like, uh -huh. you knew Pedro had landed because there was a picture of a nug and like a tall can of beer. And he's like, landed in damn, bruv. <laughs> yeah, oh, dude, Pedro is the best. It was funny. I was talking to Ryan the other day because we were, we were like kind of thinking about like, oh, I'd be tight if we could get uh some of these um like yesteryear uh df guys out to do rap battles with some of the bots guys and he said pedro and i was like i don't know if i can get a hold of pedro and he's like oh is pedro a road man and i was just fucking like laughing for 30 minutes <laughs> but yeah i would certainly describe pedro as a road man um he is he is a wild dude we had a lot of fun in amsterdam too actually to be uh to like connect points here um the the botz rumbles were actually conceived the whole idea of it we i came up with in amsterdam because of the rumble that they did there with pedro and like a few of the other dudes that were just in the audience they were just doing like a freestyle rumble where everybody would just pass bars and i and like you know my like kind of drug addled brain in amsterdam at like three in the morning or four in the morning at some coffee shop afterwards was like oh what if we did that and we wrote and we had like big names and everybody did minute rounds and that and then you know within like a year we were doing the first botz rumble and the botz rumbles are so cool like dan broke it down it's people rapping against one another but instead of a, a one verse one or a two verse two he was having eight people so you had to pre prepare about seven different people and and try to yeah. memorize it and not uh like forget about it and forget your lines while you're trying to maybe think of seven different ways to freestyle against what has been said to you. So it's like a complete crazy form. I would say it's almost easier in a sense because it's really easy to come up with like uh, the first round for everybody, 
And then once you get to like the second and third round is when you have to start like digging deep in the bag for concepts. And if you come up with something great, sometimes it's like, you know, it's like pulling teeth, but doing the rumble is like, there's so you're, you can just do two bars about this guy and two bars about this guy and two bars about this guy every round. And it's only a minute. So you like, if you're lucky, you'll get like between 16 and 24 bars out. So it was just always really easy to write. And uh, I think anybody who's had the opportunity to do the rumble, like, enjoys that part of it the most that you can just get out your best bars about the other you know initially we were doing eight now we're doing six i think six is more controlled like when we did eight it was like 45 minute long battle you get down to like a good half an hour with uh six people but you definitely like it's easier to just kind of hit everybody real good once around you know what i mean like do hit everybody in a circle but everybody takes their own approach too so like some people will just, I, when I was in the rumble, definitely everybody had like devoted a whole round to just murdering me, which was like, I don't know why I didn't think of that because I booked the thing and I, for some reason, peanut was in the rumble and I was like, oh yeah, well, I'll just pick on peanut. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but I, it was me. I was wrong. I was the guy and uh, everybody had at least like an extra eight bars about me. So there's always that. There's always like, you look at the lineup and say like oh someone might get a little more you know what i mean and, and we're doing one in july that's really big and we got some big names and huh? we're slowly kind of announcing that and i think as we announce the names people are gonna start to formulate who is going to be the person who gets picked on the most or you know who does the best that's what was so great about um uh dan's league uh, bots battle of the zay is he came from it as a battle rapper who was tenured in the old format and the new format. And so I feel like he was bringing new uh, forms of battling to it. Like uh, some people uh, who don't know battle rap have seen the compliment battles, which are very popular as an offset. But Dan, even though this person had already battled before, Dan put a transgender person against one of the biggest names in battle rap and gave them a platform. What was it like bringing that all together and the experience? Well, you know, like to, I credit where credit's due. I mean, like we, uh, Jolie's the homie. We like uh, booking battles for no shame. Uh, always good performances. And, oh, really good, um, really good cool rapper. It gives a, yeah, yeah. I always thought I, I thought it was cool because, like, if you're, you know, uh, if we're gonna be like talking shit about any specific like person, we should. Everybody should be represented. You know what I mean? So, like, I always thought that having representation from like all walks of life in battle rap would just benefit everybody because then the jokes fly further. You know what I mean? Like not that it would close things down, but it would open things up. And I think a really good example of that is Bonnie Godiva versus uh, no shame. You did, you did two of them. Sorry. I was speaking have. about another one. My, my fault. I was speaking oh, no, about the Pat Sayo. No, no about Pat. but that's great. You mentioned it, Pat. but I was just saying like with the Bonnie and no shame one you had, Bonnie saying shit that I don't think anybody would say about No Shame because she's a black woman. So she's like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? I'll say whatever I want. And then you had No Shame saying shit about Bonnie that I don't think anybody would saying about Bonnie because she's like, I'm transgendered. So like I'm everybody like they felt like they were coming from a place where they had the license to like take it at further. So I think like while the Pat battle is certainly more offensive, <laughs> the Bonnie and uh, No Shame one shows like a wider range of like what can what you can do if everything's on the table and like at the end of the day, we're all going to like shake hands and not be offended by this shit. But like what I meant by the credit where credit's due shit is, is it was actually Pat's idea to do that battle. And um, I, you know, we just happened to be the league that were consistent booking battles for no shame at the time and uh you know there was certainly some doing on our part but it was well worth it booking pat is is uh he's a guy who you get your money back on as far as like eyes on the battle promotion just performance like he does it all so um yeah pat's idea pat came down and executed it was kind of gross <laughs> i just sit there and watch it i felt like this is a really like bad idea because like with that like representation thing right like i also you also have to keep in mind that you got pat who's like just one of the best battlers in the world and no shame who had maybe done 10 battles at that point pat like i think he was in some of the first written 
battles ever. Like the Element League's ones were like predate grind time. So this is like one of the most seasoned battlers in the world, one of the best performers in the world. Um, and like ultimately he's making like a wrong point <laughs> or like some, I, I don't agree with anything he's fucking saying, but he's winning the argument. You know what I mean? So um, it was definitely like an eye-opening situation for me because I was like, oh, I created this scenario where like now like no shame is just getting bullied. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, fuck, you know? But that's the battle rap for you. At the end of the day, like ain't nothing's going to save you but your own skill in there. So, hey. Well, and I think on... Happen? On no shame side, like no pun intended, she had to have balls to do that. You know what I mean? Like it was yeah. to, to do to to because you know what you're going against. You know the platform he's going to put you on. You know, so kudos yeah. But to I her. also think that like you put opportunity in the situation before the reality of like how much you are likely to get your ass whooped. You know what I mean? So like, um, I don't. I think at the end of the day. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I'd, I'd have to, I think she goes back and forth on whether or not she like is glad she did that battle. Like some days I feel like she is. And some days she, I don't think she is at all. So, uh, you know, that's it's just, like I said, man, it's like, ain't nothing but your skill will save you in there. And nobody wants to get their ass whooped on camera. It's no. like, take it from me. Like it's happened to me before. So, uh, yeah, I, I could definitely see like being like, yeah, in retrospect, I maybe shouldn't have took that battle just based on like where my opponent was skill wise. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah. I don't think I don't I like I can't relate, man, because like I felt like I was one of the best when I was doing it. But the one battle where I really got my ass kicked was way more a matter of me not preparing properly than me like being out completely outgunned because I think when I like the shit that I had was working, I just didn't have enough shit. You know what I mean? So uh, that's different than like this, a scenario where you're just outgunned all the way through. And I can't think of, of any battle in my, I did in my whole life where I was just getting fucking the shit kicked out of me. You know what I mean? Are you talking about Andy Milanakis and Dirt Nasty or Charlie Clips? No, Which one? Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> I think I was just like a judge for that. But I, I no, I uh, that 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 just made me memorize it. But um, so Dan also makes amazing music. Like forget me not, he is he is amazing. He uh, I interviewed Lush, who was like one of uh, I look at this certain part of battle rappers who are also rappers in the West Coast as like a weird let's say a white renaissance of death row records in a sense just like with the multifacetedness <laughs> that there was before all the crazy shit went down but so dan uh one of my favorite uh albums of his is 30s which was released in 2018 and yeah. um since then he has gone on to uh start a thing called death dealers anonymous with fellow rapper reverse live and that has it's such a cool niche uh difference in between just having a face to the music because in this sense he doesn't it's not this beard that we know from dirtbag dan it's just music and what um led you to change from just being doing the thing that everybody else is doing to trying to do something different i guess um always everybody's always like i'm always trying to do something different i was always trying to do something different like the whole fucking time but uh do, do you i don't know i felt like for whatever reason, there was always this like uh, idea or like, like, I don't know, like a box I built for myself where I like, okay, this is like what you can rap about. You know what I mean? Like, this is what you, this is what's in your wheelhouse. You know what I mean? This is what people, and less about like what you know and what you've lived and more like what people will accept from you. And uh I think almost everything that was ever made and released under the dirtbag Dan moniker was like lived in that world was like, okay, this is what people will accept from me. And then um, that, you know, I don't want to say that got boring, but I felt like I might, might have took that as far as I could. And it's also like annoying to like, I go back and listen to like the shit that I put out in 2001. That's on the fucking internet still i i need to figure out how to get that shit off the fucking internet but 
it's just it's a dumb it's an 18 year old kid he don't know shit <laughs> you know what i mean so like there's like people you get to like watch me grow up and that's painful to like for as you know because it happens over the course of like five albums <laughs> so it's like almost jarring but uh i was like very happy with 30s to the point where i was like okay i don't want to do this anymore like that's that's the last dirtbag dan album that'll ever come out and like that's as i did i told as much of my fucking truth as i wanted to and like now i don't want to do that anymore so i like realistically i was just at that point when we started making music i think we did a song called ghost blicky and we were just like having fun making music and uh try beyond hush and then uh at that point i kind of decided i was like you know uh i'm only gonna make this kind of music i'm only gonna make shit that's fun so like we would be at uh in la and we'd be at chases and we'd end up recording shit and it would always be like in that vein just like first off the top about fucking whatever super fun and cody certainly like masterminded the death dealers shit he it was his idea and uh you know we kind of together built it from just like being like oh, okay we're just gonna kind of make these like super dark trap songs and and not you know try to be as anonymous about it as possible to the like green screen mask like keying out our face like kind of the whole vibe of it being like this like dirty vhs snuff flick thing that that all kind of like grew with the music and now we're doing this shit like uh cody's last album and the last dda album were produced by dj akosa who's like who was certainly the guy who was making the music that inspired the dda shit you know three four years ago so it's kind of come full circle in the sense that uh you know we went from like having an idea of what we wanted to make to like fully like we're like embedded in this scene making this music and there's a good amount of people who don't know who dirtbag dan is or that that's dirtbag dan on those songs and i think that's like probably one of the more valuable experiences i've had as a musician and so me and dan spoke last night um I had mentioned to him that I feel like uh, as as to what he just said to add on to it, they're not looking at it as Dirtbag Dan, whereas a very close uh, thing in the music industry to me is the group The Gorillas, whereas they have animations in all of their music videos and you don't even know what any of the members look like, but you just listen yeah. to it for the music and what it is. Yeah, and I think that's what like the goal is, is to get people to put the music and like the visual element of it like the whole package in front of the idea of like this is created by a person who that person is how, what is their relationship to the material like it's just like uh i don't think people watch you know tv shows and movies and they're like that guy's not a cop you know what i mean like you you're that like we suspend that kind of uh like analysis of shit when we're watching a tv show or a movie because it's like part of our role as the audience like we sit there and accept that this is a police officer that's a serial killer this is the story right you know what i mean so like ultimately that's what we want to do with the music is just like put people in a position where they just have to accept what's happening versus like trying to decipher whether or not there's like a uh, a real element of it and i don't know what the fuck like that whole shit is detrimental to the to hip-hop as a whole i mean i think and i think that's why like it there's this like idea that you're you're better off being like an actual criminal and then writing music about it than like you know having knowledge and like maybe having like lived on both sides of the line but like ultimately just devoting your life to making music and making music about shit versus like being an actual like i don't know it's like we celebrate motherfuckers getting murdered and uh losing super talented artists at super young ages because it brings authenticity to the music and that's that sucks <laughs> you know what i mean like i would way rather like i would I think the world would benefit 
from another Pop Smoke album more than like Fools knowing that he was a real ass dude. You know what I mean? Like, and that's, I don't know. I agree with that 100%. I'm a big hater and I'm a big like old hip hop head, even though I'm young. But I got into Juice World after he died. And Juice World to me was just phenomenal, man. Like he actually like was speaking about a lot of things that you can relate to what no, no matter what it's like, whether it's relationship wise, addi- addiction, depression, you know what I mean? You can relate to anything. Like I always talk about dear mama by Tupac. He was raised in the ghetto and he's talking about a ghetto and, and like a different situation. But I looked at it as my mom being a single mother and you take certain things. And, and I think that's the biggest meaning. I'm going to forego that to before death dealers just to mention and to like no homo dick ride, I guess. Uh, yeah. Suburbanites is one of my favorite songs by you. And it is, oh, it's yeah. almost a life story, man. And, and I listen to it, even though there's certain scenarios. <laughs> Sorry if you hate the song. I love it. No, all right? I don't. I just, I, it's like, it's a good song. I just like, it's not one that I like ever enjoy listening to, or I, I never performed it. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's like Van, Vanessa Carlton doesn't like a thousand miles, but come on. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, I just want to say like in that, because in a lot of your songs, it's a whole story. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And like, I feel it was very vulnerable in a lot of your songs as well during that that time that you were just spewing your life and everything that was going on with it. And like, that really affected me as a listener and a fan, which was really cool, I found. Even if you didn't I, like you it. You know what? Uh, I think that like, in retrospect, like that's probably why I'm doing what I'm doing now in like every sense. Not only like why the Death Dealers stuff is released anonymously, but why I like pretty much stepped entirely away from social media, except for uh, promoting the rescue and the events related to raising funds for the rescue. Um, Why I don't do the podcast anymore. Why I rarely do shit like this. Um, Just because I think I, I burned myself out on being like, like open and honest with everybody. Like I just told everybody my whole fucking life. Uh, not only like through the music, but then through hours and hours of doing the podcast. And then it's like, people think that they know me and they don't. And uh, people think I owe them shit and I don't. And I just got tired of that. And I don't like, don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> and well, I hey, I appreciate, like, I appreciate the honesty. Moments, I well, like, I think that I'm, I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, I'm mad that I did it or I'm, I'm, I guess, I guess I'm happy those songs are out. I guess I'm certainly happy that I did the podcast for as long as I did. I made a lot of friends and I made a lot of friends with people I never met and that's cool too. But there is like a line that got crossed with like what was mine and what I deserve to have privately and what everybody thinks they could talk to me about or like address or whatever and i just got sick of that shit and i i definitely never want to go back to that again you know regardless of if i ever decide to do the podcast again or um if i ever release music under another moniker besides the death dealer stuff either way like it'll never be like just open door policy for my fucking life ever again like i'm just gonna have my own shit now and I think that's better. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. And you're like, I mean, like, uh, it, it's, I can understand like your perspective on that. And so I, like, but, um, you know, still part, part of like why I'm such a fan of you, but like that, I appreciate you telling me that because, you know, when you think you can, you put together, you formulate in your own mind, what a person is when you listen to him, whether it be yeah. a celebrity or rapper or whatever, you yeah. know? And so, that just opened up a bit more, man. So like, I appreciate it. And that like, and the more me understand. you give people, the more they know you. And then at some point, like when you're like, you don't fucking know me, you're wrong <laughs> and you're lying. <laughs> or like, you know, you have to accept that. Like you put that shit out into the world. Like I went on tour specifically. I remember it being in Canada and people kept wanting to talk to me about Ron. And I was like, I don't want to fucking talk with strangers about my dead friend. And like, at some point I was like fucking mad about it. And I just wanted to be left alone. Like, and I would just get off the stage and fucking go to the van. Um, 
And that's like, that's not, I guess it's like, these fools are like, they're grieving an artist that they like have a connection to. And then they get, they have a connection to me and then I'm there. So they want to talk to me about that. So it's like, it's not fair of me to even have that uh, attitude towards it. So like, I put myself in this position where I have to be uncomfortable to honor like my fans and my friend. And that's, that's a shitty position to be in. No, so for, like any, for like, sure. if, if I could not do that in the future, if I could not put myself in a position where people want to like address me about stuff that I don't want to talk about, like strangers, then, then that's kind of where I want to be with it. I think a big problem these days is people don't understand social cues. And like, if I, like to me, if I was at one of your shows, why would I, why would that be the thing I mentioned? I'd be like, Hey, I thought it was funny when you rubbed your balls on Oreos and gave them to somebody yeah, no, to battle, people... you know, like <laughs> I like, and rest in peace, Cadillac Ron, I'll give you an instance for me. I went to, I live in Ottawa and Bender is originally from Ottawa. Rest in peace, Bender. Yeah. I went to a memorial of his at a nightclub and a few uh, KOTD members like organic went right. And rather than just being there and appreciating Bender and appreciating the music and the people who were speaking, everybody just wanted to get pictures with organic. And I was just like, yeah. That's ridiculous, man. Like, yeah. So no, I'm sorry that that happened, man. And you know what? Like that just makes me, you know, understand a bit I'm more. I'm just sorry that Bender's gone, that Ron's gone. Exactly. Gone. Like, like at the end of the day, like my being feeling sorry for myself about it is pretty small in like the grand scheme of like how much it just sucks that those dudes aren't around it anymore. Um, but it's you know, I'm also like honored to like fly the flag for those dudes in a way that like I'm, I'm I'm very happy I don't want people to think that I don't want to talk about my friends like that I'm super proud to know and like it just like over and over again like night after night you, when you're already vulnerable because you're like away from your family on the road and like just tired and exhausted like that maybe that wasn't the time and maybe that was like but it's there certainly is a time like there certainly is a a place where you can come and talk to me about ron or ph or bender i'd be happy to tell you a story about them you know what i mean like it's i don't know i don't I just want think people to get the i just think idea. you need to, no it's and it must be tough man because if that's the, the subject matter that everybody's going to bring to you why that the, to me that's just going to spread night like that just doesn't make sense you know like i can understand in a way but you made a song about it so they shouldn't they can just listen to the song there, there's your perspective you know what yeah, i mean but like, then, yeah that's but like i was saying it's like then when you do that you open the door for those for them because you have yeah. the name on the song but yeah, yeah, yeah just yeah. rest in peace to those guys and all i all i do is i want to spread the positivity i what my last memory of cadillac ron was him just spreading positivity man and like just being an honest ass person and one of the coolest people you know like his episodes on your podcast were some of the most entertaining episodes and and um um like you know what man let's segue that into you started a podcast when podcasts were still kind of on the up and up and it was a battle rap centric podcast hosted by a battle rapper so the guests you were getting were phenomenal and then you created this cast of characters it was like a battle rap howard stern show you know, and like, uh, and and I understand why you ended it. Peaky Blinders is going to have its last season. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to be yeah. watching 20 <laughs> seasons of Peaky Blinders, but yeah. it, it was, it, it, it must be somewhat like fun to remember. I mean, there's probably agnostic and a lot of bad things around it as well, too. But no, no, it was just such a cool, fun era, man. Like every Wednesday night I was tuning in, you know, it was, it was like a, a tonight show almost. But. I have a very like positive attitude about the podcast and like, uh it was like it was super fun and when i look back on it we did like a lot of stuff first um oh yeah and i think that like a lot if you look at a lot of at least in our world the media that exist not just like podcast or like web series or whatever but like everything like the way shit is structured is a lot like a lot of it is comes from this like playbook that we like built super high, just like fucking around, never taking it seriously. Um, always never like having a direction, like, and almost like fighting, uh, like trying to like format it in a way that made it 
<laughs> like digestible or successful. <laughs> we were just like, we just were like, like, what can, you know what? Like there was a, like, there, we had this like weird animosity for the fans that was like fun. Like, you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? So like when people would like want us to do something, we'd always pull away from it or like do, if people didn't want us to do something, we'd do more of it. Like, I don't know. Like on, just, on a, like, on their podcast, there was a there was a segment where they would get fan questions as videos, and I always wanted to because I thought I had a take, but I didn't send them in because if you're a fan, you want a reaction, but you guys just roasted the fans that were really passionate, pretty which much was every hilarious. Time. Yeah, very and, rarely. Like there was like the Irish Rasta. There was like two people that sent in videos that were like, "Oh, you're cool," <laughs> like everybody else just got fucking completely destroyed. And it would be like not just by us, but it would be like disaster. They're like, "You're a piece of shit!" Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like, or Ron, Ron, like threatening people. Like, oh, Logan, like Logan from, from Canada. From, Logan from <laughs> Carnales is salivating right now. Like that. Moment, there's so many good moments, but like, it. You know, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> it wasn't ever meant to be uh, successful. Like, I, it's not like we didn't want more people to watch and we didn't want like people that like enjoy it but like it was a I feel like if we're being honest it's a lot more for us than it was for the audience and that's kind of like been a hallmark of like everything I've done up until this point <laughs> like my whole life has been like this endless pursuit of me just trying to like keep myself entertained and do as little like work as possible in the process and now i'm like doing this dog rescue shit and it's 100 percent the opposite <laughs> it's like hella work <laughs> and uh you have to be super thoughtful and you have to think about your actions and like i do want success like i do want this thing to grow because i know that means i'm going to save more lives so well, yeah, let's segue that into uh, Adopt My Block, uh, Dan's yeah. rescue agency for dogs. He recently mm -hmm. he, he stepped down a few years ago from the podcast and he pursued yeah. he pursued uh, what seems to be a passion project. And and it's with his wife. And yeah, yeah. I just want to speak about how that came to be, man. It's her idea for sure. I think we just like walking our dogs in the neighborhood. Uh, our dog at the point. Shit, I can't believe we have some new dogs. Um, we it gets cold out here, you know, nothing like there, but uh, you see dogs that are outside and they don't have shit or they got like a lame ass little dog house. And, you know, I mean, we're talking chihuahuas sometimes. So we're like, no, no, no. We need to like just drop dog houses off for these people or like fucking collect sweaters for dogs and put them on these little chihuahuas that are in the neighborhood. And uh, that, as we were doing that, people started like surrendering dogs to us. And then we're like, okay, well, we can get them rehomed and figure it out. And then, uh, you know, I don't know how it just kind of snowballed real fast into like, okay, this is necessary work. Then like the, the pandemic happened and there was nothing else to do but this. Um, my wife, who's a hairdresser, couldn't work. I'm not doing shows, you know, I mean, there's no like, my, a lot of like what I've done my whole life has been around based around like live performances. I was doing stand up comedy too, and everything just stopped, just dead. So we started, you know, going full force into the idea of making a dog rescue. One of our close friends is a lawyer, and she is like, Yeah, we could draw up the paperwork and have you guys like an official nonprofit, you know, and this could be what you do for a living if that's what you want to do. And I just like kind of everything else in my life. I was just like, yeah, look, sure, let's do it. And it's crazy how that was only a year ago. Cause now we're like a, a full blown dog rescue. Like I was yesterday talking to you while like I dropped a puppy off in Brentwood, like an hour and a half away and then drove and I drove straight to Burger King on the east side to go pick up a little homeless schnauzer to go take to the vet to go get like and every day is like this every day is like someone needs help somewhere there's a dog that needs something there's a dog that needs to go meet somebody and it's just you know it's it's definitely uh taking over my entire life but I'm, I'm i'm happy about that that's awesome man that just seems like that's like 
it seems like that's what you were meant to do overall. You know what I mean? You said you got, were trying to do these, all these different things and you never really were completely happy with it. And, and then like, I, I don't know the way you speak about happy. it though, is just, is so passionate because it's such a big yeah. thing to like, say, I want to do this or be like one of those people who talks like post a thing about animal cruelty, but like to do that, man, like, like it's, you're completely saving, saving lives. You know what I mean? I think what, like, like I've always been someone who didn't put like the roadblock of I can't in front of myself as much as like other people do. Like that's why we've been able to do, we were able to do as much as we were like with, I mean, I don't, we, I never fucking was signed to a record label. I never had any like major financial backing. Like we, I traveled around the world, started my own battle rap league. You know what I mean? Like flew people in from around the world. Uh, got to you know make music on all these different like stages and all these different levels and stuff and it was all just kind of like like I was saying like I never even was taking it seriously I was really just like trying to have as much fun as possible and and, like it not work (laughs) and uh this is just now it's like I can't see myself doing anything else but this really it because there's no that same kind of attitude I had towards everything else I've done where I was like yeah I, I love this but I'm ultimately doing it for me like that doesn't exist anymore like I'm certainly doing this for these dogs and that that's like there's just a different energy behind that kind of work yeah man that's well you know I commend you and if any uh do you guys have like a donation thing or a thing that people can send money to yeah for sure uh adopt my block dog rescue.com is our website um our instagram is at adopt underscore my underscore block um we we have uh, all our donation links on our social media if you're local to uh the bay area and uh you're looking for a dog we could definitely connect you um we typically work like one dog at a time and we like to focus on older and at-risk dogs but lately <laughs> we've been working a lot more than one dog at a time and sometimes it's puppies so uh I'm uh I'm happy to place dogs with people that I know from uh rap shit. It's happened once or twice before and it's always good because I get to see those dogs either on social media or like at events and stuff like that. And these guys like I fucking love all these dogs. Like this dog Bunny right here, she's she got so like she's not all in the world these dogs and all these dogs so anytime i get to place a dog somewhere where i get to check in on it uh, yeah man. more often like once a year is great that's so cool and so i'm also gonna link i'm gonna link the website uh on the description for the episode um yeah. uh, i'm gonna bring it back a little more because i forgot one topic i did you got me in my giddiness and my fanboy so uh Dan also went from being a battle rapper to a comedian, as he mentioned. And so like, yeah. I always wanted to know what the transition was like, because I'm sure it's easier than somebody who's never performed in front of a crowd before, but yeah. it's probably different because the reaction is different and, and it's not, you don't have to, re- you can't just rely on one person that you're focusing on, you know, like, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Definitely way harder to write material um, for just like general shit that's funny to everybody than like looking at an opponent and destroying that opponent like it's so much easier when you have a focus but just in general like comedy is such a funny it's it's such a funny thing it's like uh (laughs) it's it's not it's not the type of thing that you could just be like flash hella good at like rapping was one of those things like you can fucking just start rapping and then within a year or two be fucking amazing just because you have that like natural talent like there i mean certainly people are naturally funny and certainly people are like more gifted a- in their ability to communicate with an audience but like the art of going up on stage and like night after night being funny is certainly like a tenured thing like you have to have experience and you could kill it one night and like literally like 20 minutes later be at another mic and fucking 
just bomb. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and comedy was definitely one of those things I did for like, I did because I haven't done it in so long. Like I didn't want to do a zoom comedy show. I, I'm, I'm actually hosting a fucking comedy show tomorrow. Um, there's a, a BOTZ event here in San Jose. Uh, Chewy is battling reverse live. And then uh, at the same event later that evening, there's a comedy show and I'm just going to be hosting the comedy show. But uh, comedy is like one of those things where you got to do it for a long time to get good at it. And anytime you think you're good, you'll see somebody who's really good and you'll be reminded of how far off you are. Like, I never felt that way with rap. Like, I'll be battling, making music. Like, you can firmly plant the idea in your head, whether it's true or not, that you're just as fucking good as anybody else on the planet that does this shit. And, like, that's certainly how I felt and feel about rap. But <laughs> comedy? No. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not even in the top fucking 50,000, 500,000. It's, it's so tough. Way to go. I, I'm yeah. such a fan of comedy myself. So like somebody will show me a, a random new comedian or something, but I compare like it. Mine is like Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, Richard Pryor yeah. and or Cat Williams. And, that's and you so you can't, and so, and I can't, so I can't laugh at somebody who's just a, and I worked at a comedy store too. So then you just kind of, you become bitter just like in hip hop almost, you know, <laughs> once you do something long enough, I feel like you become, and, and in my case, you know, I'm not the most oh, positive yeah. person in the world, but yeah it's yeah. a hard it's a hard thing to do man and uh i definitely will like continue to oh try. He, his comedy is hilarious i'm not try, i was just saying like regular people but i think the understanding is what you were saying is like dan's comedy is hilarious and and i didn't I expect guess. i didn't expect <laughs> it to like, be great man because i'm a hater but i listened and i and i liked it i usually hate stuff these days so that says something i just think it's i like there's so there's such a huge gap between like the level that I'm was ever doing comedy on. And like those people that you mentioned, like the Chappelle's and rocks and like the, the fucking legends of the game and shit um, that, and like I said, like with rap, I don't feel that way. Like, I feel like you, like you're getting some of the best bars and the best writing period from rap battles, like better than anything that's in any like released music. And a lot of times like the quality of music isn't determined by its popularity. You know what I mean? Like there's tons of stuff that nobody's ever heard of that is the best, you know? And like, oftentimes that like that stuff stays the best among like the community of people who actually love music and never permeates to like the rest of the world who just like casually takes in music and becomes like one of those pop, hits you know what i mean but with comedy it's like there's certainly like if you're that funny if you were that good like there ain't a dude who's just as good as uh you know like dave Chappelle that nobody knows about you know what i mean like everybody who is ever that funny like because you can only be that funny by being on that level like being yeah. on that pedestal and being put in that position where you have to create hours of material and shit like that like bro i'm, I'm writing five, 10, 15 minute sets max. That's the most I ever did was like a 15 minute set. I think we did 20 in Colorado and it was bold. We were, I was like crowd work half the time, but yeah, um, dude, that compared to like a 45 minute, it's like, there's a, it's, it's fucking a world apart. It's like, uh, you know, it's like paying, playing a pickup game on the street versus like playing in the NBA. Like, and yeah. that's not, like I said, with rap, it's not like that. It's like, you could hear a dude on the street in a cypher who could be one of the best motherfuckers in the world. It's just nobody ever heard of him before. Yeah. And, uh, and that's like one thing about comedy that is like, I, I enjoy about it is that, Oh, I could do this forever and never be great. You know, uh, that's cool. I, I, that's, that's fun. I'll definitely continue to work at anything that you can always work at. That's all. That's awesome. I think it just goes, goes to show your character. I'm just like, yeah, man, the podcast was amazing. Like, you guys, yeah, we didn't really want a fan base, but like, we enjoyed it for what it was. I mean, you're a great comedian. Yeah, you know, I, I like comedy, but like, I'm never that good. I love it, bro. I, I love this. Thing so I think I'm just getting old, and the older you get, the more like you start looking at the things with like a wiser lens. And 
naturally like you're just like oh yeah that's not I, it wasn't what i thought it was <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> whereas like bro for me like because i'm just like right now i'm unemployed because of covid like you, i just got a new job at a weed store and then the weed store shut down because of covid um but like uh so i started doing this podcast because i need to be creative and like i should like i showed my buddy the other day because i used to always bump your music in the kitchen i was like yo i got dirtbag dan on and he's like what are you talking about how'd you get him on you know what i mean whereas like Dude, and that's like call him I tell my girl, I tell my girl, yo, I'm giddy. You know what I mean? She's like, he's just yeah. a person, Sam. He's just a fucking yeah, person, yeah. you know? But really? like, and then you find out, like, that was the other thing too. I think people like, I've, I've definitely made a career of like letting people know how much I'm just a person and to like my own benefit or detriment. Cause you can never really be like a mythical creature if people meet you and then you're just like oh you're just a fucking dude you know oh, what I mean? bro when i That's first met story of my life well, i used to look at battle rappers as celebrities and i remember going to my first event once i came of age and i was like half these guys are fucking losers man and, <laughs> all, like, and, all, yeah, and all they're doing is here. talking about battle rap, battle rap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> i don't want to talk to you terrible. about battle rap i just want to talk to you about as a genuine human being terrible terrible yeah that's the, that that's that's it right there in a nutshell and that is still going on to this day uh, oh yeah you know and god god bless all the homies that are still doing it i i really i enjoyed my time um and i don't like i definitely don't look at it like one of those things like i commend people like the source who are still able to continue to like find good material and have fun battling um because i just got to a point where i couldn't anymore and uh i i do honestly think that if i tried to get in the ring with one of these like regularly seasoned battlers like i would probably get beat in a way that never happened to me when i was in the game you know yeah but i think like that's the thing right like if there's a certain like you know what i mean nobody wants to hear a joe budden record anymore you know what i mean like you like it, there's a certain time and a, a place but um before before we sign off i want to do one more thing that i think i don't know you might find funny was my favorite segment you guys had on your podcast which is what i would show mm -hmm. people who don't know battle rap at all was the bad battles mm -hmm. of the week. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Another thing that we did, bro, like, okay, bar pong, that's a whole show now. Like, somebody yeah. else just has a show where they do bar pong. Bad battles, like, that was a whole show. <laughs> like, all these things that we did on the show just became, like, like the, the, the entire format for some other podcast. And, like, to their credit, they took our, like, not very well fleshed out idea and turned it into, like, a solid thing. Um, but I, I'd like to think that I'll get some credit. You know? The OGs though, man. If Bone marrow. I die, I'll probably end up outliving all of these motherfuckers. And that'll be like the biggest joke on me is that I never get the credit for all the shit I created because I lived longer than the idiots who took it from me. Bro. I have a friend who doesn't know you or anything about battle rap and he still texts me bone marrow here now. Or yeah, you got a shitty stuff attitude. Like stuff like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, you, you got a shitty attitude. So. I'm going to fuck you in your house with food. <laughs> <laughs> Shouts. Yeah, man. Thanks for, thanks for uh, giving me the time to uh, have you on, man. I really appreciate it. It's just something I'm starting. I don't know if anything will come from it, but I just wanted hey, uh, to talk to people that inspire me. It, you know? I will tell you, I'll tell you what, uh, the, like the best combination of, uh, of, creating content is something that you like you physically enjoy the process of doing so as long as you physically enjoy the process of doing it do it and like that's what we did with the dirtbag dan show for eight years like we just i did it until i physically didn't enjoy doing it anymore so like as long as you're having fun keep them fucking coming and uh people will the energy will be felt you know what i'm saying it's the first time in my life in a while where i get butterflies in my stomach when i upload an episode so like I haven't had that happen in a long time, but yeah, man, thank you so much for coming on. Please people go and look up adopt my block. Please yeah. listen to death dealers anonymous. Do you have anything new coming out in the future? Um, well, Cody just put out an album called uh, soapbox sermon. Um, it's uh, him and DJ Koza reverse live DJ Koza. Uh, it's a boom bat project. It's fucking dope. Um, we're in the process of working on, uh, Death Dealers Anonymous Volume 4 and another uh, DDA Exocosa project. So we'll have two more DDA projects drop before the end of this year for sure. And then um, when DDA Volume 4 drops, like the first three Death Dealers Anonymous projects 
if you look them up on YouTube, they're like whole movies. It's like a 20 minute long play thing. So uh, we're going to do another one for volume four. And then we're going to release like an hour long VH. That's awesome. all of them. So. All right. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And um, thanks, man. Yeah, Once boy. again, thanks really appreciate it. Uh, definitely. Um, oh, yeah, check out the dog rescue, uh, adopt my block, uh, at adopt underscore my underscore block or adopt my block dog rescue dog rescue.com. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, I'm going to sign off now and say thanks to Dan. Thanks for tuning in next week. We have chase Moore, super producer. So please Shout. tune into that. Yeah, man. I'm just trying to, you know, get the whole gang back together, buddy. Let All right. Go. Thanks for listening, everybody. Enjoy.